I have to start by explaining a little bit about this title. Um, even for even for myself, which is what I do for a living, cellular molecular mechanisms of pain sounds really boring. So, um, what I what I want to try to do within the contest within the context of this school is, and a more appropriate title will be um, the relationship between the cellular molecular mechanisms of nociception, which is injury detection, and the perception of pain. And how the two things, how, how can we understand the two things and the connection between the two? So because we're going to speak or talk about pain, the first thing we have to ask is what is pain? Is it a sensation, a feeling, an emotion? We have already had some discussions about all these concepts. And the reason for that, the reason why we ask that is that we all know, we learned that from school, there are only five senses, vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. And this comes from Aristotle, so it's a long way. So somebody that has been around for two and a half thousand years is probably must have some truth. And Aristotle thought that um, pain and pleasure were not senses, they were emotions. They were the consequences of stimulating the senses in a, in a pleasurable way or in a painful way. So if you stimulate the senses in a nice way, you get pleasure. If you get in a nasty way, you get pain. And he called them the passions of the soul. Uh, now we call them the emotions of the mind or whatever it is. But So what is pain? Now... Um, this is, uh, I, I will discuss some quotes about this. This is from Thomas Lewis in the 1940s. He uh, was a physician in the UK. Pain is known to us by experience and described by illustration. And I, I highlight these two words. It's an experience that we have to assess on other people. So if you see somebody like that, then we think he's in pain. This particular form of pain has an extremely good and almost miraculous treatment, which is for the referee to award the penalty against the other team, <laughs> and, uh, at which point the pain completely disappears. But that is a different thing, and it has a neurobiological explanation too. Um, pain is a disagreeable sensation which everyone has experienced and which we all recognize. This must be probably the most useless uh, thing that has ever been said about pain. Um, it's equivalent to tell a, a man or a, a woman who has been blind for birth that everybody knows what the color red is. Um, so if you never experience pain, and some people are in that category, and you can't recognize it, you will never know what it is. That comes, obviously, from a surgeon. This is part of the problem of being a surgeon, I suppose. Uh, James Mackenzie in the 1900s. The International Association for the Study of Pain, which is our main professional organization for those of us who study the mechanisms of pain, defined pain in 1979 as an unpleasant, these are, the highlights are all mine, unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So you see, we come up with experience, an unpleasant, both sensory and emotional, associated, it doesn't say cause, it says associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So it, 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 that was, that this, definition takes into account clinical, clinical relevant pain, the pain of disease, where there is no uh, cause for it, or sometimes the patient just describes it as related to tissue damage, even if the physician can't find anything wrong with the patient. So even when there is something there which we can't explain, we still describe it as related to the injury. And this definition is the one that is the most popular now, the one that stands, because it really covers all the different aspects of pain. The one that I want to consider today, and I think that is the most relevant in the context of the, of the topic that we are discussing today, is Sherrington's definition. Sherrington, in 1900, defined pain as the psychical adjunct of a protective reflex. And apart from the fact that this is beautiful English, and that you can't say more things with fewer words, there are only seven words there, and just try to think that with fewer words. It just exactly encapsulates the problem that I want to discuss today. We have a protective reflex, and to tell us that this wasn't really very nice, and to teach us not to do it again, we have a psychical adjunct, whatever that means. So the two things together produce the generation of pain. Pain is our most efficient learning tool. I think it's been shown before 
that rats only need one shock to learn, humans need about the entire life. <laughs> but still, we learn with pain. Now, um, Sherrington's definition of the psychical agent of a protected reflex generates a second concept that Sherrington himself described, and that's the concept of nociception. Nociception is the processing by the nervous system, by the brain, of injury related, which he called noxious signals and events. And we can find that, this processing by nervous system, in any animal, in humans, even in invertebrates, uh, it, even though it's not a nervous system developer such as he was mentioned early on today, in bacteria and single cells. Every living creature has a system to process injury-related or noxious signals and events. And if we, if we take that away from the consciousness side, from the psychical adjunct, then we have a completely different process called nociception, which is directly amenable to the scientific method. And we can study it. And this is what we do for a living, those of us who study the mechanisms of what we call pain, which in fact it is nociception. So there is a protective reflex in all animals, including humans, which is nociception, and there is a psychical adjunct, which is consciousness. If you ask me now, at the beginning of this talk, how the two things are together, the answer is, I don't know. But then nobody does. And how one thing leads to another is a matter of belief. Whether you believe that you have an immortal soul, whether you have to believe that it's all a byproduct of brain activity, that that is where the link is. So pain as the psychology under for protective reflex is going to be the basis of which I'm going to discuss now. Consciousness is when, not, is when nociception becomes pain. And this is extremely important because this is what we do and this is what our patients tell us. And we know that there is a link because if we alter this, we can also alter this, but we don't know what that link is. And the relationship between the activity on our nervous system that we can track at molecular level, at cellular level, electrophysiologically, action potentials, connectivities of neurons, and what a patient brings with a complex painful experience is precisely the nature of the human consciousness. So when we talk about pain in non-human animals, we will attribute similar kind of feelings and sensations to those animals to which we attribute a similar level of consciousness. And we don't to the ones that we don't. So a bacteria, for instance, which will have, may say an invertebrate, which will have the same kind of network to protect it for injury, we don't think that it has this kind of pain experience. And so now we can go up in the animal scale and get closer to humans and probably, you know, primates maybe, you know, so how about a gorilla or a chimp? And, so that link between the neurobiology, the nociception, and the pain perception is what separates the different interpretations of what is a pain experience in humans and non-human animals. And within our own species, it's also what separates between communicating and non-communicating humans, for instance, babies. Do babies feel pain the same way that we do? Because we do not remember our early years of our life, which is when we acquire our own self-consciousness, we don't have any recollections and therefore any feeling that we had much pain when we were a few months old. And yet, probably there was something there. So the relationship, this is kind of almost like the old thing of ontogeny and phylogeny, but essentially it's much the same thing. When we have somebody that we cannot communicate with, be that because it's... Uh, uh, babies is still developing or because you just cannot communicate for whatever other reason the relationship between this and this is made by the observer not by the subject we make that relationship when we observe that as we did with Cristiano Ronaldo early on in, the, in that picture is that guy really in pain um, the protective reflex it starts with this man I mean I don't need to tell you anything about that the car and with this famous uh, representation of pain mechanisms. And this is how, for us, when we look at nociception, and we're going now to move at the nociception side, we can follow up this pathway all the way up to the brain. Descartes uh, was a dualist, largely because he was very scared of the Catholic Church, but this is a different story. So he decided that the man, 
man was a machine, that the human body was a machine, and that there was, of course, an immortal soul, which is above it, and so on and so forth. But let's not get into this, and that that machine will behave in a kind of automatic way to certain stimuli. And when it comes to pain, it represents, in this very nice uh, drawing, that uh, whenever the uh, noxious stimulus, the injury, affects some sensors here, and then the message is transmitted all the way to the brain. He was obsessed with the pineal gland, of course, but that's a different story. And then there will be another message going back to the muscle, and it will uh, pull the, the, the muscle away. And he thought that this was an optical system, which was like a little mirror there where the, the um, messages will be reflected. And that's what he called that a reflex. And we still call it a reflex, even though they know that it's not really a mirror there. But it's still the, the, the um, nomenclature remains. And in the case of pain, he said, well, ainsi que tirant l'un des bouts d'un corps, on fait sonner en même temps la cloche qui pend à l'autre bout. Which, for those of you from out of town, means just as pulling one end of the cord, one rings the bell that hangs at the other end. The best example of a protective alarm mechanism. That's it. So you do something at one end, you, get, you, you ring something at the other. And this is the model that we've been working with for the last 400 years. This was in, published in 1664. And this is the textbook that we use with our medical students, published in 2010. And other than the fact that it's now in color rather than in black and white, there is very little difference with the Descartes model. And we have a little bit more details of anatomical structures. We have peripheral sensors, we have a pathway that goes in this thing, and that is described as a pain pathway. So we continue to have this kind of neurobiological model for the protective side of the uh, pain signaling, what we call nociception. So let's, let's uh, get into a little bit of these things in a little bit more detail, and how much we can detect, how much we can know about the processes by which this protective reflex comes into. For instance, the signal of injury. Do we have in our body sensors that are specifically associated with the signaling of pain, the signaling of injury? That is not a minor question because, as I said before, we know or we, we're told uh, that there are only five senses, vision, hearing, touch, touch taste, and smell, and the pain is not in there. And this, for a long time, was interpreted by, and following this kind of Aristotelian um, interpretation, that it was the abnormal, excessive, uh, inappropriate stimulation of these senses that will generate pain, so that there will actually be the pattern of activity within all these senses that will produce the pain signal, rather than the activation of a specific nociceptors. And yet, in neurobiology, we were getting more and more information and more and more data that there was, in fact, some, some type of sensors in the periphery that would respond exclusively to the application of a lesion or the application of an injury-producing stimulus. Now, uh, there is an example here. As, uh, as the uh, previous speaker mentioned, most of the data I'm going to present are from my lab, not because it's particularly the best, but it's because it's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, of a mucosal landing in the ureter, for instance, we know that these things are associated with the signaling of pain from internal organs. This particular one was stained uh, to show the contents of a neuropeptide substance P, which is also related to a local inflammatory drug. So there are a number of, of evidence that we can show that, this, uh, that these sensory endings are there. And of course, we are very much still within something that many of you will be familiar, which is with Miller's uh, doctrine of a specific nerve energies, which is an old one, a very slightly pompously named, but nevertheless very effective, um, that says, and this is from his own writing, translated in this case from the German, that sensation is not the conduction of a quality or a state of external bodies to consciousness, but the conduction of a quality of a state of our nerves to consciousness excited by an external cause. So, yeah, I mean, we don't need to get into the details into these things, but what we see, what we perceive, what our relationship with the universe is not reality. This is when you, you reflect about that. It seems a little bit frightening at the beginning. What you see and we perceive is what we have senses for. And the world looks very different to different animals depending on what these senses are. So unless you have a sense organ for a certain kind of uh, sensory input, you would never perceive that particular sensory input. And 
The best example is that all of us carry our cell phones, and yet we are, none of us is aware of all these electromagnetic waves that are here, and that, as, and that they are as real as this computer or this screen, but you just, we don't perceive them. So if we perceive pain, we must have some kind of sense organs that are related to the, um, to the perception of injury, to the detection of injury, and we do. And here is probably the best and most definitive answer and um, an example of the relationship between discharges on peripheral sensors and pain perception. This is a technique called microneurography, which you probably are familiar with, or may, you may know. Essentially, it's done in, in conscious human beings, and what, what it entails is the insertion of very fine needles, my electrodes, through the skin and into the nerves of the, uh, the ones that are more accessible are the ones of the extremities. So we have a conscious person here with whom we can communicate from which we can record the action potentials that are generated by the nerves in response to peripheral stimulation. And in this particular case, we had an example of one of these uh, discharges on, a, on an afferent C fiber, which is connected to the pain receptor or to the nociceptor. These are the reverse frequency responses of these afferent fibers. And this is the rating that this person makes to a, a small burning stimulus applied in the receptive film. And as you can see, that uh, as the discharge in this nociceptor increases, the burning uh, sensation increases, and as the discharge progressively decreases, the burning sensation decreases. So there is a perfect relationship between the discharge in this single uh, nociceptor or pain receptor in the periphery and the perception by the subject. This is pure laboratory pain. So this is uh, very little to do with the pain that the patient will feel on a complex disease. This is just to show that we can, under these circumstances, es essentially provide the evidence that Descartes wanted with this boy, so that we can have a perfect relationship between the discharge in a peripheral receptor and the pain perceived by the subject. So under certain circumstances, this relationship exists. Now, what's the link between the two? Go back to the first question. What's the link between nociception and pain? Now, the point with the receptors is that they are very plastic as well, so they are not fixed, and there is not, uh, the, what Descartes go wrong is that if you have a, a cord that you pull and the bell rings, and you pull several times, the bell will always ring at the same time. And, and what he didn't get right is that you can pull the same cord many times, and sometimes the bell rings, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it does ring very hard, and sometimes it rings very little. And the reason for that is a modulation process that happens all the way from the periphery to the cortex. I, I showed you this thing just to show that, just to go back to that uh, pain receptor that you find in the ureter, that there is a complex relationship between the, uh, the signal, the afferent fiber that signals that, and the, the local microenvironment in which this afferent fiber is located, in the urothelium and so on. I just indicate a few of the transmitters involved. 3 b one which is the capsaicin receptor that activates it uh, opens uh, all sorts of channels and produces an activation of the fiber. ATP, a pure energy mechanism involving P2X3 receptors. And all of these things, depending on how they work, can produce different responses to the same stimulus depending on the circumstances. Particularly if there is an alteration in the periphery leading to an inflammation and so on. As just as an example on some uh, recent work that we are now uh, doing, we even detected cannabinoid receptors in these nerve endings in the bladder. And they are the same cannabinoid receptors as some molecular biology uh, detection of these of this, uh, molecules. They are exactly the same ones that are produced in the bladder are the same ones that are produced in the brain cortex, and that they are leading to the psychotropic effects of cannabis. And although it may not be very clear here with the, uh, with the light, but we can detect these cannabinoid receptors. This is the bladder itself coexisting with a 3B1 receptor, which is a capsaicin receptor that activates specifically the nociceptors. When the two are merged, you see some of the fibers, so you'll see it in more detail there. And when we move that to an electrophysiological environment, we can find that the stimulus response curve of our pain receptors in the bladder under normal circumstances, this is done on a mouse uh, isolated preparation, which is here in blue. If the bladder is inflamed, the response is enhanced, so that they're now on an inflamed peripheral organ. We have an increased activity from the receptors that are going to signal pain. And if we then um, administer 
a, a cannabinoid C1, C2 receptor agonist, then we produce here in green a reduction in the response to the inflammation, particularly on the higher pressures of the blood. This is the sort of thing that, that, that the sort of work that leads to the development of treatments for this kind of inflammation, cystitis, and so on and so forth. And this is entirely done in the periphery. So we can produce a great deal of modulation of pain sensitivity by the modulation of these nociceptors, of so these pain receptors in the periphery. This is even before we get to the central nervous system. Um, another example, it is again just to, to within the uh, internal organs, with the ureter. We have two types of sensors. This is the, the pressure levels of the sensors that we have in the ureter. We have a low threshold group, which are the ones that are responsible to the normal homeostatic functions of micturition and passing urine and so on, and they are not related to pain. And we have another group here in red, which have a much higher pressure. They are the ones that are activated when people who have renal colics and people who have pain produced by uh, contractions of the ureter. But if we um, inflame that organ, or if there is any kind of lesion in that organ, this population of U2-2 receptors now becomes the one in blue, U2-1 receptors. So the thresholds for response decrease substantially. And as a consequence of that, then they are now activated by the same innocuous stimuli that would normally activate the organ. So that then just the normal passing of urine from the ureter becomes painful. And this is just a consequence. So far, we haven't got into the brain of the plasticity and modulation of our own sensors in peripheral organs. So we have a, a considerable amount of that plasticity at peripheral level. And this is precisely the question that we have here. It is that, that pain sensation is a dynamic sensation. And the best way to explain this is by looking at the relationship between the uh, stimulus intensity and pain sensation. We have a pain threshold that separates intensities between innocuous and noxious. We have a normal uh, exponential pain curve, which indicates the amount of pain and a saturation point. This is normal. This is good. We all have it, and this is how we respond to pain. In the presence of an injury, what we have is that what, what happens is that this curve is shifted to the left, which is the opposite with any other sensation. All the other sensations will shift to the right and produce sensory adaptation. Here, what we have is the opposite. And as a consequence, now we have a pain threshold in the innocuous range. We have a portion of the curve that we call allodynia, which is pain produced by innocuous stimuli. And we have an amplification of the pain signal, which we call a hyperalgesia, which is that pain that before it was very little, now is very large. And all of that is the response of our brains to whatever is happening in the periphery. So that when you look at, and we call that sensitization, at persisting pain uh, states, which we do have, of course, all that we have been talking about in the presence of an injury, that there is an inflammation, that there is a, a change in the properties of the pain sensor, but there is also a response of the brain itself, the brain and the spinal cord, which produces a sensitization, an amplification mechanism, which dissociates the stimulus with the response and makes the pain persistent. If we are... Um, hammer our thumb in one second, for instance, then we have a pain that lasts for three or four days. And that dissociation of the stimulus, of the temporal dissociation of the stimulus between the duration of the stimulus and the response is due to the brain response to that pain, percent, to that pain stimulus and the increased sensitivity of it. Now, um, how is that done in mechanistic terms? Well, we, we mentioned that before. The peripheral nociceptors can be sensitized, and although you can't read it very well there, it's primary hyperalgesia, so you get an, an enhanced sensitivity, which is due to a peripheral change. But then there is also the central nervous system. And what we have here is that the increased activity from that focus, of that peripheral focus, is going to change the way in which the brain interprets all the stimuli coming from the periphery are going to have areas, so-called of secondary hyperalgesia, which is pain in normal areas of the body, which is produced entirely by a central alteration. And this is what we now see more often on people with chronic pain, or people which are suffering from uh, the pain of disease, that they may perceive some alterations in the pain sensitivity, which are originally due to a focus, to a primary focus somewhere else, but they are now due to the response of the brain to that particular incoming stimulus. 
And then we will have, in terms of the, of the molecular processes, a process of sensitization of the nociceptor as the triggering cause. We have a process of synaptic strengthening by incoming afferent bolus, which is central sensitization itself. And we have a process of um, activation of nociceptive neurons, which is the pain system, by sometimes even by touch. So people may just have a tactile, uh, even cold or a, or a breeze or something, I will produce an intense pain. And this is all produced by these changes here. And as I even say from the beginning, we know a lot about these things from the cellular and molecular mechanism. What we do not know is once we put all of this picture together, how that moves into the conscious experience of pain. Although at the end of the talk, I'll tell you one way in which we can dissociate it to a tricky way. So, uh, examples of how we do that in the lab. We can measure, we go back to, this is all in animal experiments. We can measure, you see in blue, a normal response. We don't, get in, we don't need to get into the details. In this case, uh, with um, uh, painful stimulus, like capsaicin injected in the skin, you get an enhancement of the behavior. This is a behavioral uh, response, as he was describing some of the pre previous talk, to a somatic stimulus to a visceral stimulus, but then we can match this behavior exactly with the same type of curve to the responses of individual neurons. In this case, it's no longer behavior. If you look at that axis, this is the, the spiking activity, the action potential generated by individual neurons within the brain in normal or after inflammation. And you can see that the shifts in these functions, they all match with each other. So we can follow the process from the beginning and say, well, we can detect the process, we can detect the, uh, the effect in individual neurons and we can detect the behavior in the animal and we can match all of these things and try to interact with them and modify them pharmacologically. Another, yeah, just an example of how we detect these things. We can recall the activities this is in an anesthetized animal. We can recall the activity of a single cell here with a receptive field in the pore, uh, which to begin with only responds to an oxygen stimulus but not to an innocuous one. The application of an injury or the production of a small injury, a very localized one, increases. You can see the sensitized process. This is all CNS activity. The sensitized process of the neuron and also the fact that now it acquires responses to brush, to touch, to light, to stimuli. So again, that matches very well the behavior that we detect in this animal and the clinical symptoms that we see in the patient. So that allows us to, to follow this nociceptive system uh, practically to the end, just to see and to detect within the brains of the animals, and of course we can also that, do that in humans under certain circumstances, what is the neurobiological foundation of the sensory process that we are seeing. Uh, for instance, we can, uh, and this is a particularly interesting thing, we have detected that some of this sensitization process, this increase in in uh, central nervous system hypersensitivity is mediated by a process of synaptic trafficking of glutamate receptors between pre- and postsynaptic activity in, in most of these neurons, which is identical to every single molecular element to the process that hippocampal neurons develop during the formation of memories. Uh, we were talking before about building blocks. These are even more elementary building blocks. We have similar processes in our brain that depending on the, on the location and the organization of the network may produce, on the one hand, the formation of memories, may produce, on the other hand, the generation of chronic pain sensations. Uh, and this has been taken to the point that now some people, some of us, talk about pain memory as the generation of a chronic pain state, which is, of course, what, what makes pain become clinically relevant. The fundamental uh, molecular process is the same, and it involves, I mean, I don't want to get into great detail, but it involves this trafficking of glutamate receptors that we can detect with molecular biology. Even 10 minutes, in this case, this is the increase on the uh, glutamate receptor and the NMDA receptor and the glutamate receptor on the membrane of neurons, even 10 minutes after the presence of an injury. So even at a very short time, we can already see that there is a synaptic plasticity developing into these cells, which happens to be exactly the same process as we can detect in the formation, on the early formation of a memory in hippocampal neurons. We can also detect or generate pain states in the absence of an injury in some of our models and, and look for the molecules that are relevant. In this particular case, and these are a group of animals, this is done in mice, in this particular case we look at the responses 
to a series, increasing intensity series of stimulus in, in three groups of animals, one of which is ovarectomized. All we have done to these animals is to remove the ovaries. And five weeks after removal of the ovaries, here they are in red, these ovarectomized animals have developed an increased sensitivity to pain in their abdomen, which matches very well a syndrome which is very well known in women, which is chronic pelvic pain, uh, persistent pelvic pain. In this case, we cannot detect an injury. It hasn't been an injury. Just all that happened is that these animals have, been, have, have had their ovaries removed. And we know that it is not related to an injury because we can actually reverse it with uh, hormone replacement therapy. So if we give these animals now, after removing the ovaries, uh, estrogen, ex ex exogenous estrogen, uh, 17 beta estradiol, we find that the ones here in blue, and we have lost all the, all the, unfortunately, all the codes here, but the, uh, the estradiol group is the one in blue. The one in blue do not develop the hyperalgesia, whereas the ones that have been ovarectomized and are implanted with a pellet that does not, con does not contain estrogen, but a placebo, they have developed this hyperalgesia. So, Modifying the hormonal state of these animals, first by removing the ovaries, and then by administering hormone replacement therapy, modifies the pain state that they can produce. And this is all done entirely in the CNS. This is nothing to do with the periphery. This is all to do with uh, estrogen receptors in certain parts of the brain and in other um, areas where a hormonal balance determines the final perception of pain. We can also do, uh, by genetically modifying certain mice, modify pain perception, and particularly this central increase in hyperalgesia, by changing certain channels in certain neurons. In this case, we generate uh, uh, knockout mice, these are genetically modified mice, which lack one particular transport for chloride ions across neurons, which is related to the actions of GABA, for instance. It's just a neurotransmitter. And in that case, when we test them behaviorally, we find that these animals cannot generate touch evoke pain, which is this allodynia or this increased sensitivity, but they do have other forms of hyperalgesia. So we can cause profound changes in the responses that these animals, we don't know what, if it's really pain, this is just the nociceptive responses of these animals to certain uh, injury states by modifying very elementary processes of ionic transport in certain neurons in the brain. And this is uh, this can be reversed under certain circumstances by altering certain ionic channels. So, the, the problem that we get when we get to this point is that that's fine, and this is, as I said, that's what we, we dedicate our lives to it. Um, but how do we link this with the subjective perception of pain of a human being, which ultimately is the reason why we study pain, because we want to, to see it and treat it in other places. How we can separate nociception from pain? Or how can we link the two? How can we take them? There is a very good way, which I wouldn't advise you to try at home, to separate nociception from pain. It's for you to have a frontal lobotomy, which is, in medical terms, is called a prefrontal leucotomy. There is Dr. Walter Freeman here doing that. He used to do it ambulatory to people. He did over 4,000 in the U.S. alone. Initially, on... Uh, it just it's like if you're putting things to their eyes, and so it was kind of remarkable. One of the most um, famous patients was Rosemary Kennedy, the, adult, the uh, sister of uh, President Kennedy. Um, initially, this was done to treat psychotic behavior. Then it was found out that psychotics who also had chronic pain show changes not only in their behavior, but also in their responses to pain. And then he tried it on people who just had pain, no psychotic behavior. Um, particularly terminal pain, you know, cancer pain. And what happens when you do a frontal lobotomy, when you separate your frontal lobes from the rest of the brain, is that these people, if detected with laboratory pain, as we can do, we just take that they had the same pain threshold, they had the same pain sensitivity, they had everything perfectly normal in terms of the sensory component of pain, but that pain didn't make them suffer. They didn't bother about it. Didn't bother. It's difficult for us to understand what it means, but it didn't bother them. It just, you know, yeah, fine, it's something that I, I, I don't care. And because 
you break the link between pain and suffering, you also break the link between nociception and pain. And then pain becomes just a sensory event of little consequence because it doesn't make them suffer. And I'll give you an example taken from one of his patients. There he is doing it. Um, this was a terminal patient. This was, had no psychotic behavior of any kind. This patient was perfectly normal psychologically. It's just that he had an invasive carcinoma of the pancreas, 42-year-old, as some of you may know. Carcinoma of the pancreas is one of the most painful forms of internal pancreas. So he was a white male, hapless dependence on morphine. He could just he was taking morphine like anything. Bilateral lobotomy was performed. Postoperative, this pillar of society became a pugnacious practical joker. Eventually, after one month, the patient regained equilibrium and psychiatric abnormality persisted only insofar as to make him the life of the party. Now, he had, at that point, he had no morphine whatsoever. He had no analgesics of any kind. And I can tell you that carcinoma of the pancreas is one of the most painful processes that anybody can have. So he had the sensory pain, but he didn't bother them. He just dissociated them from pain and suffering. So we know that the, this link is in there. Uh, we know that it's somewhere in the relationship between our frontal lobes and the rest of the brain. We can trace all of these neurons and they are connected in terms of a nociceptive mechanism, but we still don't know what that link is. And I think um, it would be nice to know and to learn from you. Um, I started with this and I'll finish with this. Pain is a psychological of a protective reflex. Sherrington's magnificent definition and a little reflection on human nature. Um, we have here a combination of nociceptions, feelings, emotions, um, hyperalgesia, all of these concepts that I've been adding to it and that we, you'll have to put together in order to understand that. When Sherrington wrote that, he was 43 years old. 40 years later, when he was 83 years old, he wrote a letter to one of his friends and he wrote, pain remains a biological enigma, so much of it useless, a mere curse. <coughs> the difference between this statement and this statement, this is talking about a protective <coughs> reflex and a useless reflex, is essentially the difference between a 43-year-old man and an 83-year-old man. <laughs> A little commercial from my side, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.